Anatomy is one of the oldest branches in medicine, and it focuses on the study of human or animal form by observing or examining living beings, dissecting dead specimens, and examining specimens microscopically. The term anatomy comes from the Greek word anatome, which literally means dissection or cutting up. Now, the study of human anatomy can be traced back thousands of years, at least to the Egyptians, um, but the science of anatomy as we know it today did not develop until far later. The Edwin Smith Papyrus, uh, which was found um, or produced around 1600 BCE, is an ancient Egyptian medical text named after the dealer who bought it in 1862, and the oldest known surgical treatise on trauma. So this document, which may have been a manual of military surgery, describes 48 different cases of injuries, fractures, wounds, dislocations, and tumors. Now this image that you see here is only a portion of it. The entire Edwin Smith Papyrus is a scroll that's about four and a half meters or just over 15 feet in length. In this and other similar works, many major organs were identified, along with basic observations such as that the heart seemed to be the center of the blood supply and connected to all the blood vessels of the body. Now, nomenclature, methods, and applications for the study of anatomy all date back to the ancient Greeks. Medical texts from these times start to show an understanding of things such as musculoskeletal structure and the beginnings of understandings of the function of certain organs, such as the kidneys. In the 4th century BCE, Aristotle and several contemporaries produced a more empirically founded system based on animal dissection. Through his work with animal dissections and evolutionary biology, Aristotle founded this field of comparative anatomy. Now, he didn't have everything right, however. Uh, for example, Aristotle thought the heart and not the brain was the location of intelligence and thought. The first recorded school of anatomy was founded by the Greek scientist Herophilos in Alexandria around 300 BCE, when they first allowed for medical officials to cut open and examine dead bodies for the purpose of learning how bodies operated. Now, most of the early dissections were done on executed criminals. The first use of human cadavers um, for anatomical research occurred when Herophilus and his fellow physician Aristratus gained permission to perform live dissections on condemned criminals in Alexandria. Um, it's thought that their number of victims actually totaled uh, near 400 prisoners during these procedures. As the first physician to dissect human bodies, Herophilus is often considered to be the founder or the father of anatomy. He reversed the long-standing notion made by Aristotle that the heart was the seat of intelligence, and he actually argued instead that the seat was, in fact, the brain. The last major anatomist of ancient times was Greek physician Claudius Galen, who was active in the second century and emphasized the importance of experimentation, though most of his experimentation was done on animals. Uh, for example, in one of his dissections, he strapped a pig down while it was squealing and struggling. And during this time, Galen accidentally cut the laryngeal nerves that innervate the larynx, that's the region of the throat that houses the vocal cords. So the pig stopped squealing, but it continued to struggle. So after this first experiment, Galen then traced the laryngeal nerves in detail and conducted more research using different animals, including some uh, birds and um, other mammals. Uh, the nerves, uh, he was able to discover that those nerves began from what na we now know is the 10th cranial nerve or the vagus nerve. And so he was able to determine that there are different signals going to, the, to control the movement in these animals versus the uh, vocal sounds that they were producing. He was actually the chief physician to the gladiators in Pergamum. And this allowed him to study all kinds of wounds without actually performing any human dissections conveniently. Uh, this allowed him to change Aristotle's notion that the heart was the center of reasoning, as gladiators that were wounded in the heart remained lucid until their death. Later, he was actually appointed physician to the Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius. While some of his theories were faulty, for example, that blood was produced in the liver and consumed by the rest of the body, these theories on human anatomy dominated and influenced the medical sciences until the Renaissance. So many anatomical advancements were curtailed almost a thousand years and just, until just prior to the European Renaissance when it became mandatory for students of medicine to take a course on human anatomy and surgery. The first Western medical school was originally established as a monastery in Salerno, Italy. So during these times, many human bodies were actually dissected in public for anyone to observe, and usually in an amphitheatrical style. So the first anatomical theater was built at the University of Padua in the 1500s, and it served as a model for others throughout Europe, such as the famous anatomical theater and Leiden University in the Netherlands. In Leiden, uh, some various 17th century depictions, such as the one you can see here on the right, 
show that living observers were actually accompanied in the rows by large numbers of animal and human skeletons. Now, while some may consider this method of instruction a little barbaric and primitive, I'd like to actually take you on a little bit of a tangent and tie in some local connections to this type of anatomical theater, and specifically at the University of Virginia. So the University of Virginia, if you look at this photo from, or this um, artistic drawing from 1856, you'll notice in the foreground on the left-hand side, this small little building right there. Uh, that building is actually the anatomical theater of the University of Virginia. Uh, this opened in 1827 and it was actually designed by Thomas Jefferson. He was fulfilling the request of a professor of anatomy there, uh, Dr. Robley Dunglison, who found that the campus's original teaching facilities were quite unsuitable for cadaver dissection. He also wasn't too pleased with how close those facilities were to his place of residence. So early in the 19th century, dissecting cadavers was frowned upon as disgraceful and immoral, and the General Assembly of Virginia actually refused to sanction it. So as a result, medical instructors and their students increasingly turned to grave robbing. They stole mostly from African-American and pauper cemeteries, although they sometimes requested the bodies of convicts. These populations were socially and economically disadvantaged, and they didn't really have sufficient legal protection for their dead, unfortunately. One of the professors who was well known for his participation in these uh, methods was Dr. John Sage Davis, who was a professor of anatomy from 1847 until his death in 1885. He often sought the help of intermediary agents in Richmond, Norfolk, and Alexandria, Virginia, who made arrangements with men that were called body snatchers or resurrectionists to take cadavers from the cemeteries of sizable slave, free black and poor white populations in Virginia's leading urban centers. He would then have these body snatchers pack these bodies into bran or sawdust in large whiskey or oil barrels, and then transport these barrels by train from the Richmond Petersburg area out to Charlottesville for the University of Virginia to use. Now there is fortunately a, a very well-preserved set of letters between him and some of his various uh, colleagues and collaborators that really give a fascinating look at the role of an anatomy professor in that mid-19th century. Um, so for example, um, when at one point he was uh, asked, you know, well, what would happen if there was a shortage of desks and they were having difficulty getting some, he said specifically well, that Richmond is so distressingly healthy at this time. Um, in another case, people qu um, queried what might happen if you know a barrel went astray and ended up at the wrong spot. And there was actually an article in the Alumni Bulletin that recalled an individual known as Miss Betty, who made the, quote, mistake of opening a barrel that was intended for the anatomical hall and instead, um, instead of the barrel of sweet potatoes that she expected from the Isle of Wright County. Sometimes trouble also occurred when they lost contact with some of these body snatchers or resurrectionists that worked for them. Um, so for example, in another one of these communications between Professor Davis and um, another colleague at um, the Medical College of Virginia, you know, the uh, VCU Medical Center, um, this anatomy professor who was, again, one of uh, Dr. Davis's contacts in Richmond wrote, to continue my lectures, I was forced to play resurrectionist myself, by no means a pleasant profession when the snow is eight inches deep and the thermometer near zero. Now, several letters in the Davis collection relating to anatomical dissection don't concern the removal of bodies from graves, but instead actually using the bodies of executed criminals. In 1779, Thomas Jefferson actually proposed a bill to the Virginia General Assembly concerning crimes and punishments where he advocated that those were that were convicted of petty treason or the murder of certain family members should be hung and then their bodies delivered to anatomists for dissection. Uh, however, not only did Jefferson's bill fail in the General Assembly, but another act that same year then prohibited the dissection of executed murderers, though this didn't prevent students or Professor Davis from pursuing this as a potential source. At one point in 1883, Davis actually wrote to a doctor in Martinsville saying, we were never so much in need of subjects as now. Is there anybody to be hung in Henry County whose corpse I might procure? 
the following year, the General Assembly did actually make cadavers legally available for medical study for the first time. In 1884, the Virginia Anatomical Act, which had the dual purpose of promoting medical science and protecting graves and cemeteries from desecration, was passed in order to regulate the disposable of unclaimed bodies to be buried at public expense. So this opened the way for many bodies to be used legally for the purpose of anatomical study. The use of the building um, continued until 1924 when the Board of Visitors then declared it unsafe for medical students. And soon after, the new uh, medical school building opened and then the old building was reconditioned to house the School of Rural Social Economics. But ultimately, the building was torn down in 1939 and there's a small little plaque that um, is, can be found even at the University of Virginia at that site, noting that this was the site of Thomas Jefferson's anatomical theater uh, and stating on this site stood the first building devoted solely to medical instruction at the University of Virginia. Now, as I mentioned before, anatomy comes from the Greek word anatome, which means dissection or cutting up. And there are considered to be two major subdivisions of anatomy, gross anatomy and microscopic anatomy. So gross anatomy focuses more on the structure of body surfaces, regions, and sections, as well as the organs and their relationship to one another. While on the other hand, uh, microscopic anatomy deals with minute entities such as cells and tissues. And under this field, cytology, which is the study of cells, and histology, which, uh, which is the study of tissues, are going to be explored. So some examples of uh, some of the subdivisions, for example, in gross anatomy is co um, our comparative anatomy, which uh, is where researchers are able to study the similarities and differences across species, developmental anatomy, which looks at structural changes from conception through maturity, embryology, which is looking at developmental changes occurring prior to birth, regional anatomy, which studies all structures in a single region. So for example, all the muscles in a region, all the blood vessels in a region, everything in the region of the neck. Um, surface anatomy, which studies superficial and internal structures as they relate to their location on the body surface, and then also systemic anatomy, so structures involved with a specific activity, uh, such as, for example, digestion. The human body can be sequentially subdivided into several different layers of organization that are very nicely depicted in this figure from chapter one of your textbook. So if we think about the structure of the human body from the smallest possible perspective, we can consider us, we can start by looking at atoms or molecules, so really focusing on the chemical level. Once you have multiple molecules that are coming and start functioning together, that is when we're going to get to the level of the cells. When you have multiple different types of cells that are interacting with each other to perform a similar function, that is when we get to the tissues. Likewise, as we continue on up with this pattern, when you have multiple tissue types that are working together to perform a single function, we make our way up to the organ, and then ultimately organs are going to be working together to, use, um, to, talk, uh, to form an organ system. Most of these are probably very familiar to you. You've probably spent a lot of time in previous classes talking about atoms and molecules of cells. You've certainly been exposed to organs or organ systems. Uh, tissue is the one that students in this class uh, are typically least experienced with. It's sometimes touched on in introductory biology textbooks, but not always addressed in the classes directly. So I would um, encourage you to give this area specific attention because, again, it's probably the one that you're least uh, familiar with. There are 11 commonly recognized organ systems in the human body, and several of them are depicted here. And I would bet that if I was to give you a couple minutes to sit there and try to name the organ system that is being depicted in these figures, you could probably uh, figure it out. Maybe the first one would be a little tricky, but um, the integumentary system is one of them. That's the skin and the um, layers that are just immediately below the skin. The skeletal system, the bone uh, structure, uh, bone and cartilage and some fibrous other connective tissue involved with the skeletal system, um, muscular system, nervous system, the endocrine system that is associated with the production of hormones and other chemical signals, um, and the circulatory system. Of these six systems right here, these are the main ones that we're going to be focusing on during the first, two, uh, first three quarters of this class. We're not gonna really touch much on the endocrine system, but as um, in this class, as we are taking our regional approach to the body, 
in, um, in each of these regions, we're going to be looking at the skeletal, the muscular, the nervous, and the circulatory, circulatory components about it. And also in the second module, we're going to be tying in the integumentary system. In addition to those, we also have the lymphatic system, which we are another uh, chemical signaling and transportation system that ha um, is strongly tied into immune responses. And this is unfortunately one we're not going to get to in this specific class. Uh, and then we also have the respiratory system, digestive system, urinary system, and then both the male and female reproductive systems. These latter four that we have here, respiratory, digestive, urinary, and reproductive, are going to be the main focuses of our fourth module in this class. So all of these 11 organ systems contain these organs that work together to perform very specific functions. And again, all of these organ systems together are then going to make up the organism. So what about our regional anatomy? Um, if we're looking at the structure of the body, we uh, divide it into two main body regions, the axial region and the appendicular region. The axial region all occurs along a vertical axis in the center of the body, hence the name axial. And this includes the head, the neck, and the trunk, while the appendicular region includes the upper limbs and the lower limbs. As we go in a little and focus a little more closely into these different regions, we can see how there are several more specific regional terms that are able to uh, describe areas within these two major subdivisions. This is a very important figure in your text. I would give this a lot of attention and make sure that you're comfortable with these. Some of these are probably ones that you've heard of before. If I was to say the term nasal to you, you'd probably know that that meant the nose. If I was to say the word femoral, you'd probably associate that with the thigh. Um, but some of these are probably ones you haven't heard of before. Crural, for example, is referencing the lower part of the leg. Um, brachial is a term used for the arm. Cervical is neck, um, and so on. So um, while this isn't a figure that you by any uh, means need to go and memorize right now, keep this, um, give yourself easy access to this figure so you can go back and reference it throughout. And so you understand that when we are using certain terms, uh, we are using that for a specific region because that is actually a descriptive term. It's kind of an anatomical adjective if you want to think about it that way. So uh, kind of tying into this language of anatomy, one of the most important features that we need to emphasize right off the bat is what we refer to as anatomic position. Um, anatomy is all uh, uh, strongly relies on relative positions to each other and that's what a lot of the terminology relies on and all of the, that relativity is based on anatomical position. If I was to be able to get you to stand up right now wherever you happen to be watching this video and assume an anatomical position, this is what your body should look like. So anatomical position is defined as standing upright, the feet are parallel and they're on the floor, head is level looking forward, the arms are at the side of the body, and one of the most important ones, notice that the palms are facing forward. This is what makes anatomic position a little more different than what you might consider to be a comfortable position. I would bet that most of the time if you're just standing up and standing still, your palms are more facing probably towards the inside part of your body. If you are laying down in a bed, just flat on your back, I would bet your palms are probably facing down, touching the bed. So your arms are actually in the opposite there of anatomic position. So now that we know what anatomic position is, we can start to use additional adjectives to describe the relative position of one body structure to another. Here are probably what are considered to be the four most common pairs of terms. Um, see if, based on your readings, you can go ahead and pause this video even for a second. See if you can tell what I am trying to describe just based on those arrows that you see there. And you can go ahead and pause this and then restart it after you've had a chance to kind of test yourself. Okay, so hopefully you were able to deduce that between the blue and the red arrows. I'm trying to indicate that something could be considered either anterior or posterior which are in humans at least synonymous with the terms ventral and dorsal. Specifically, anterior is, say, is referencing something that is in the front or towards the front surface, and posterior is towards the back. Ventral and dorsal are not referencing front and back, but they're actually referencing belly and back. Now, in a human, the front on the back, the front is essentially synonymous with your belly, but think about something like a dog, for example. The head would be at the anterior part of the dog, but the belly that's facing the floor is in a completely different axis. 
So in a bipedal organism, an organism that's walking on two legs, anterior and ventral are synonymous, posterior and dorsal are synonymous. But in a quadruped, in an animal that walks on four feet, that is not four legs, that is not the case. Sometimes when we are uh, giving these descriptions for various anatomical structures, it is going to be specific whether you have to use the terms anterior, posterior, or ventral and dorsal. In some cases, the terms can be used interchangeably and will be specific throughout the course whether we would accept either one or whether we are going to be specific about which one we want to, um, to use. The second picture there, the green and the purple arrows, are depicting the concepts of superior versus inferior. Superior is implying closer towards the head, inferior closer towards the feet. The next one, pink and orange, is um, referencing proximal and distal. Proximal means closer to the trunk and distal is farther to the trunk. So specifically those terms proximal and distal are going to be used when we're talking about the appendicular body parts, so the upper limbs and the lower limbs. Now sometimes again those terms can be uh, used interchangeably. It is correct to say that the ankle is inferior to the knee. It is also correct to say that the ankle is distal to the knee. Most of the time we're going to prefer proximal and distal when we're talking about the appendages, but again you will see a few instances um, with specific terminology that the opposite is true. And then last but not least our blue and green arrows though uh, there, those are meant to illustrate the concepts of medial and lateral. Medial is referencing towards the midline of the body, lateral is away from the midline of the body. So for example, the shoulder is lateral to the neck. There are a few other terms that aren't used uh, quite as often, but to give you a few examples, um, caudal versus cranial. Caudal means tail, cranial is referencing toward the head. Uh, deep versus superficial, that one's probably a little uh, self-explanatory, internal versus external, and then ipsilateral versus contralateral. That might be one that you haven't heard of before, but ipsilateral is when we're saying two things are occurring on the same side of the body in terms of right and left, um, while contralateral is the opposite sides. We also have the concept of anatomical planes. There are four main planes, a coronal, transverse, and mid-sagittal planes. Um, the coronal planes are also referred to as the frontal plane, transverse is synonymous with the horizontal plane, mid-sagittal with the median plane, and oblique, which is referencing a plane that is at some type of an angle. Now, this individual here that you can see in figure 1.5 from your text has three different planes, three of those four planes there, the blue one, an orange one, and a green one. I'd like you to take a second and see if based on your readings and based even on the descriptions, uh, if you can discern which of those planes is which, um, uh, um, kind of match up these planes to one of these four terms over here. And obviously one of those four terms is not being used. And after you think that you've correctly identified them, I also want you to look at these three pictures that are from MRIs of the brain. Um, between these A, B, and C, again, each one of those can be matched with one of these planes between the green, the blue, and the orange one. So try to identify these and then try to match them up. And so go ahead and pause the video for a second and then you can continue on. All right, so hopefully you were able to deduce that the blue plane is referencing the coronal plane or the frontal plane. So this is the plane that's gonna divide the body into an anterior part, a front part, and a posterior or back part. Um, corona um, actually comes from the, um, the root that means crown. Uh, you may think about the beer, Corona beer. If you were to look closely at its logo, you'd see that it's a crown. Uh, the coronavirus right now, where does it get its name? It's because all of those spike proteins around it look like a crown when it's in a microscopic view. So I want you to think about this blue uh, sheet right here. Pretend it's like a razor blade or some kind of knife structure that's going to cut through the body at that angle. And if you were holding on to this with one of your hands over here and one over there and holding it up above this person and you were going to basically cut through their body, think about how you would be putting it on them in the same motion that you would be putting a crown on a person. So between those scans that we have here of the brain, so A, B, and C, which one of those do you think matches a coronal plane? Hopefully you're able to pick out that that was um, option number C. Okay, so we've identified coronal. What about transverse? Which one are we going to identify as a transverse? 
and hopefully you picked that the transverse was the orange one. Uh, a horizontal plane or transverse plane is going to divide the body into a superior or upper part and an inferior or lower part. And that transverse plane is matching up with that section A, that MRI of A. Mid-sagittal plane is then going to be our green one there. Uh, Mid-sagittal is going to, um, also referred to as a median plane, is going to divide the body very specifically into equal left and right halves. You can additionally have other sagittal planes that aren't necessarily mid-sagittal. So a sagittal plane is going to divide that body, uh, just a, another type of sagittal plane that isn't mid-sagittal, is going to divide the body into equal left and right parts. Uh, where does this name come from? Sagittal. Does that sound familiar at all? Uh, maybe it sounds like Sagittarius. And Sagittarius, you may recall, is the archer. So think about this plane, again, as a blade that is going to be cutting this body. And think about as if this was an arrow and you were t um, you kind of had a, a, a bow and you were pulling back that blade and then letting it go and it would be shooting forward into that person like an arrow. So that's creating a sagittal plane. None of these are oblique planes because um, the oblique plane, if you recall, is one that passes through a specimen at some type of an angle. So what about body cavities? So internal organs and organ systems are housed within separate enclosed spaces that we refer to as cavities. And these body cavities are named according to the bones that surround them or the organs that they contain. So for our purposes, we're going to um, divide this axial region into two different areas, what we refer to as the posterior aspect or cavity and the ventral cavity. So the posterior cavity consists of two different components. There's the cranial cavity that houses the brain and other associated structures, and then the vertebral canal that is formed by all of those individual bones of the vertebral column, and that is going to house the spinal cord. From the ventral cavity, that one, as you can see, is, is clearly much larger, and it also has several different components to it. Um, the diaphragm is going to separate the thoracic cavity that's up above, it's superior to that, from the abdominal cavity and the pelvic cavity. And the abdominal and pelvic cavities are collectively referred to as the abdominopelvic cavity. In addition, if we were to look at this from um, a slightly different perspective, um, so I've noted over here that this picture we were looking at the left was from the mid-sagittal view. Using that anatomical plane terminology before, what would you refer to this as? Hopefully you are recalling that this is a coronal view or a frontal view we can um, still see our diaphragm there and that it is still separating our abdominopelvic region from what we saw before is the thoracic cavity. But now that we're looking superior to the diaphragm, we can see how there are actually more components than just the thoracic cavity. Thoracic um, cavity includes not only the pleural cavity, which contains the lungs, but also the pericardial cavity, which contains the heart. Peri is one of those prefixes that you are going to hear over and over again in anatomy. And peri means kind of uh, the surrounding. So think about um, the word perimeter. Um, that is where that, um, that root comes from. That medial space that of the thoracic cavity that's right in between the two pleural cavities that includes the pericardial cavity um, is called the mediastinum. Uh, so this not only includes the heart that's in the pericardial cavity, but also organs such as the thymus, esophagus, the trachea, and also several major blood vessels. Now both the thoracic and the abdominopelvic cavities are lined by thin serous membranes. Uh, serous membranes are uh, membranes that, are, that consist of two different layers that we refer to as parietal layers and visceral layers. So a parietal layer is going to line the internal surface of the body wall, while the visceral layer covers the external surface of the organs, or otherwise known as the viscera, within whatever cavity that is. I'm introducing this concept of serous membranes here now. We're not going to get into these into a lot of detail in Module 4, but at least when we get to Module 4, I want you to be thinking, oh yeah, I've heard of that before. So that's why I'm going to, well, while we'll go over this again in Module 4, I do want to at least continue this introduction to it now. I want you to think about serous membranes as being analogous to a hand that's being pushed into a balloon. So later I'm going to refer to the balloon aller, um, analogy, and, I want, um, and this is what I'm referencing. So think about what this would look like if the fist was not in the balloon. There would just be a single wall all the way around the balloon and it would have air in the middle. 
But now that we've pushed this hand through, notice that we've created essentially two different walls. There's this entire outer wall around the perimeter of the balloon, and then there is the inner wall which is surrounding the hand. I want you to think that about that hand as being analogous to some type of organ. So you can see now that the organ, that hand, has an inner layer to it, it has a space, and then there's the outer layer. So that outer layer is, uh, that outer balloon wall is essentially comparable or analogous to the parietal layer, while that inner wall is comparable to the visceral layer. So what about that space in between? That's what we refer to as the serous cavity. And so that's going to be that air that's in between. And based on your position of your hand, think about the fact that you could actually put those two layers right up against them. You could push your hand all the way up to the edge of that outer balloon wall and essentially eliminate that space in between. And a lot of the time, most of the time, that's the way the serous cavity is actually going to be structured. When that serous cavity gets filled with this fluid in it, that's when a lot of times there's something wrong happening with the organ. That's some kind of um, response to, um, to something going wrong or some type of infection in the body, which is why we refer to that serous cavity as a potential space. Um, it's often not there, but there's the potential for it to be there. Another analogy you can think about for that is think about a small little Ziploc bag. You can keep the two parts of the Ziploc bag, the two layers of it directly up against each other, but you could also open them up. Most of the time, these parietal and visceral layers are right up against each other. Um, inside that serous cavity, it's going to contain this lubricating film of what's referred to as um, serous fluid. So think about the fact that how um, when you have constant movement of organs, what do we associate movement with? Friction. And friction isn't good because it not only um, can produce heat, but it can also be abrasive. And so the serous fluid that's in this cavity helps to reduce this friction and then helps the organs move more smoothly against each other and against the body wall itself. So think about, for example, when your lungs are moving as they're inhaling or exhaling. We don't want them rubbing up against that body cavity wall really harsh. We want that lubricating fluid to help them move. There are three main sets of body cavity membranes that we're going to be covering in this class. Uh, and those are mainly associated with the heart, with the lungs, and then with all of those organs that are in the abdominopelvic region. So let's start with that heart there. Um, that is what we refer to, that set of membranes is what are referred to as the pericardium. And so just as we had a parietal layer and a visceral layer, when we're talking about the pericardium, we're talking about the membrane surrounding the heart, we're a little more specific then. We can say that that's the parietal pericardium and the visceral pericardium. The lungs are in the pleural cavity and that body cavity, that body, um, that cavity membrane is referred to as the pleura. And so we have a parietal pleura and then a visceral pleura, which is right up against the lungs. Obviously things get a lot more complicated once we get into this abdominopelvic region. Uh, and this is region is, uh, and the, the membranes in this region are referred to as the peritoneum. And following the same pattern we saw earlier, we have a parietal peritoneum and a visceral peritoneum. But one thing that probably sticks out to you here is that the pattern, the foldings of the visceral peritoneum are much more complicated uh, and co um, complex than you saw, see in something such as the pericardium. So th that pericardium, you can think about the heart again as being that fist that's poking through that balloon. Um, when we talk about some of these organs that are in the peritoneum, this is much more analogous to not a fist, but the hand being open with a whole bunch of little fingers sticking through there. This here is just emphasizing to you where these different locations are. So we're going to find that peritoneum over here in the abdominal um, abdominal pelvic cavity, we're going to find the pericardium in the pericardial cavity, and then the pleura is going to be in the pleural cavity. And finally, because the abdominal pelvic cavity is quite large and contains numerous organs, anatomists often subdivide it into nine abdominal pelvic regions and four abdominal pelvic quadrants. So let's go ahead and start over here with these regions and consider what's going on here in this center column. Uh, so the epigastric region, epigastric li literally means above belly. Epi is a prefix you're going to see frequently in this class as well, and it means um, right above. Think about the epicenter of an earthquake is the location on the ground just above where the earthquake occurs. So epigastric literally means above the belly, and so this is the most superior region of the middle column. 
the umbilical region. Umbilicus refers to navel. Think about your belly button. That's the middle region of the column. And then the hypogastric region. Hypo means below, so this is saying below the stomach, and this is the inferior part of this middle column. The left and the right columns have the same names. They're just referenced um, with the term left or right. So the left and right um, hypochondriac regions are lateral to the epigastric region. The left and right lumbar regions are the middle regions that are lateral to the umbilical. And then the right and left iliac regions are lateral to the hypogastric region. And in addition, we also have, again, those quadrants. And those are just simply referred to whether they are right or left and upper and lower. So we have a right upper quadrant, a left upper quadrant, a left lower quadrant, and a right lower quadrant.